Okay, so in this second example from chapter 9, I am going to assume that we've watched and listened to the first example or have seen some examples um, elsewhere. And so we're just going to walk through the same steps, um, but I'm not going to do as much exposition as I did in the first example. So here we have, again, a situation where we want to draw out what we're seeing first. That way it's something we can refer back to and label. So we have a block that we're told is 40 kilograms. And so in this example, unlike some of the other ones that we'll see, that kilograms is mass and it is not weight. And we need to be aware of the difference and always paying attention to that difference. We also have two different supports. And so we need to label them. I'm gonna call that one number one. I'm gonna call that one number two, okay? And we're told that the board is four meters long. And that we are trying to um, figure out what the forces of the supports are if this thing is three meters from one end and one meter from the other. Okay, so that's the real picture with a combination of what's already on our slide and just reading through the given information. The second thing that we want to look at is the forces. So I'm going to draw a free body diagram. So the forces on this stick, it's always the free body diagram of the stick or bar, whatever we want to call it, beam, things like that. We have this support pushing up on the stick. We'll call that F1 because it's support number one. We have the other support also pushing up on the stick. We'll call that F2. It's the force from support number two. And we have the weight of this block that we've put on here. Weight is mg. Unlike the previous problem where we were already given newtons, we have to actually solve this one. So four times 9.8 is 392 newtons. All right. That's there so that we can go back to it because we will actually need to use those forces um, to finish this problem at the end. And we'll see why the difference is. We have two unknowns in the forces and we'll have to use net, F net equals zero. And then the third picture that we are training ourselves in this chapter to draw it is a brand new picture type or diagram type that we're trying to draw is the torque diagram. Now we have those steps that we want to train ourselves to follow and if it's useful to write them out like on a post-it note so that they're always handy, that, that could be something that we do. So step one is we draw the stick or bar or beam. Later problems will have an angled bar and we'll have to draw it angled. Here we have a flat beam and so we can draw it flat. Step two is to choose an axis. This time it's really important that we understand something important. <laughs> I said that twice. Well, it's twice as important. We need to choose a single axis, okay? So in the previous example, we had one support. The seesaw obviously is going to um, balance around that support because that's what seesaws do. In this example, we have two supports on either side. And in those, in those two uh, supports, we can choose one of them to be the axis. We can't choose both at the same time. The thing to be aware of is there is not a wrong answer for where you choose your axis. I could put it in the middle of the stick again. It would make the algebra harder. I could put it where the block is. It would still make the algebra harder. Or, and this is what we're always going to try to do, we can choose to put the axis at the location of an unknown force, which means that the axis on the left end or the right end are both the best options because it makes our math significantly easier. I'm gonna put the axis over here on the right side. I would highly recommend that after you see this problem worked out, you restart the problem and put it on the left side and see that you will indeed get the same number values for F1 and F2 in the same spots. This is F1 and this is F2. We can't change that once we've labeled them. And no matter where you put your axis, you will get the same. 
The reason that we want to put it at one of our unknown forces is so that once we write out the torque um, equation, that clockwise torques equal counterclockwise torques, we only want one unknown. We don't want to have two separate equations, the torque equation and the force equation, that we then have to solve as a system of equations. We could. It is solvable. No matter where you put your axis, this problem is solvable. But we might as well make our lives easier by putting it at one of these unknown um, forces. Okay, so step one, draw the bar. Step two, choose an axis. Step three, put the forces. We start at the left end of our board, and we see that that's where the support is. The support is pushing up on the bar, and so we draw that force up. We keep going to the middle of the bar, and we double check the wording. We're told that this is a massless board, which means we don't have to worry about the mass of the board itself. That's not realistic, but in these first two examples in chapter nine, we're not adding too many forces all at once. All right, so we continue, and here we have the 40 kilogram block sitting, but the force is 392 newtons. And then at the axis, we don't want to add F2. That one is acting at the axis. And so we do not need to put it in our torque diagram. So our torque diagram now has two forces. If we go back to our kind of list of steps for the torque diagram, step one, the beam, step two, the axis, step three, the forces, step four, the distances. The distances relative to the axis. So out of these three distances, one meter, three meter, and four meter, I want you to think, and pause the video if you want to, I want you to think about which of those three distances is not useful to us in the torque diagram that we have drawn. Okay, so for this 392 newtons, it is one meter away from where we chose to put the axis. And for this, force on the end, it is four meters away from where we chose to put the axis. And so out of these three numbers, this three meters is not useful information for our torque diagram. We do not want to put it in the torque diagram. Our distances are always relative to the axis, and that's the most common mistake that we see students make in this chapter nine. Okay, and then the fifth step is choosing the direction based on this axis where these things would actually cause rotation. So what we wanna do is think about if this were the only force acting on this stick and we had like pinned this um, stick in place at the axis, if we push down, then the whole system is gonna rotate around like this. If we think about the way that a clock should run, this is counterclockwise. And if we ignore all other forces and we just have the force pushing up like this, and again, it has to go up around the axis, then we get a um, arrow that looks the other direction. It's going in the direction of a clock that is clockwise. We never want this to be something where we're just drawing curvy arrows because we know that we're supposed to. I really do want us to understand that the reason that they're curved in the directions that they are is because we are looking at where the axis actually is and figuring out that if I am going in that direction the way that I pointed and trying to go around the axis, there is only one option. I can't go that way. If I started down, I can't curve this way and somehow get to be circling around that axis. That's what we're trying to think about when we draw these curvy arrows. So then we can write down that torques clockwise equal torques counterclockwise. That is our first condition for equilibrium, so we can write it down and recognize that just like the first example, the math here is not all that um, complex. So the only clockwise torque that we have is this one here. So force times distance, we always need both of those things, and the counterclockwise torque, there's only one, and so we have force, 392, times distance, one meter. So we divide both of these by four, and we get for F1 that it is equal to 98 newtons. So if we look at the math down here, 
if we had put our axis somewhere not at one of these two supports, we would have F1 and F2 show up here, and it would be a single equation with two unknowns. And that's what I mean by the algebra being tougher. So this hasn't finished our problem. We still have to figure out what F2 is. But now we look back at the free body diagram. And to save us some space so that it's not too low on our board, I'm going to solve the forces up here in the corner. Our other condition for equilibrium is that the net force is equal to zero. That's our, our other condition for static equilibrium. What that means when we look at our forces is that all of the forces up, F1 plus F2, minus all of the forces down, minus that gravity force, equals zero. So we can plug in. So F1, down here at the bottom of our board, we just figured out is 98, plus our unknown F2, minus 392, equals zero. So we can add 392 to both sides. We can subtract 98 from both sides. And so we get that F2 is 294 newtons. All right. So with the, um, with the example here, what we have is the original picture I had to erase, but it's on our slide. The force diagram so that we know what forces we have because often we'll have to come back to it and actually use that force diagram. Then this torque diagram, which we are training ourselves to use that kind of five-step process. Draw the beam, choose an axis, draw the forces, draw the distances, and then determine if it's clockwise or counterclockwise. Having lots of steps doesn't necessarily mean that it's tough. It just means that we want to make sure not to forget any of those things once we're drawing. Then we use our condition for equilibrium to solve for at least one of our unknown forces. We had to use our second condition for equilibrium to solve for the other. So only slightly tougher than the first example, but we will start to see these um, examples ramp up in difficulty while using exactly the same process um, that we've been seeing so far. So I will see you in the next one.